In the last few weeks between now and Holy Week, I want to make sure we cover some larger topics, so to speak, regarding God. And so we are going to cover mercy, grace, and love. These topics are important to learn and relearn as necessary because they get to the very heart of who God is. They get to the very nature of God. You see, God just just doesn't have mercy. He is merciful. He just doesn't have grace. He is grace. He doesn't just have love. He is love. Let me put this very, very simply. Our very salvation is because of who God is. And there wouldn't be a Good Friday or an Easter Sunday if God wasn't merciful, full of grace and love. There just wouldn't be a Good Friday or an Easter Sunday. So thus, this morning, we start with the topic of mercy. Mercy is a word that gets used, but it doesn't get discussed very much. We often focus on grace, we often focus on love, but we don't focus too much on mercy, and it's sometimes it's difficult for us to take in because we somehow want to take God's wonderful mercy and boil it down into something that we deserve or that he owes us. To borrow from a theologian, R.C. Sproul, he says, at first we are amazed and surprised at God's mercy. And the second time, not so much. And then by the third or fourth time, not very much at all. And then we begin, begin to expect it. And then we simply assume his mercy. And then finally, we demand his mercy and are angry when we don't get it. This is kind of the path of human nature regarding God's mercy. When we lose the amazement, the gratitude of God's mercy, we know that our heart, our relationship has been dulled with God. I would so go, go so far to say that if your faith does not burn brightly in gratitude to God's mercy, You don't grasp the fullness of the cross. To realize the importance of the cross is to realize the fullness of God's mercy. For to know God's mercy is to know Jesus Christ and him crucified. So how about this morning? We become again surprised and amazed and grateful at God's mercy. And so we are going to start with the surprise of mercy. Our reading from Gospel of Matthew, chapter 9, verse 9. As Jesus passed on from there, he saw a man called Matthew sitting at the tax booth. And he said to him, follow me. And he rose and followed him. So Matthew, whose whose name was also Levi, was one of the original 12 apostles. And... According to the Gospel of Matthew, he was a tax collector. Now, if you were here in January, we talked about that famous Zac, uh, tax collector Zacchaeus. Do you remember Zacchaeus, the lee, wee little man who was much more like Danny DeVito? Let me uh, go a little bit deeper about tax collectors. See, in Rome... To be a tax collector, what they would do is they would put out bids for tax collection. And unlike America, where the lowest bidder normally gets the job for tax collectors, it was the highest bidder. Well, I'll get 10,000 denarii, I'll get 15,000 denarii. And so thus, it became a higher level of tax collection. And that's what they were doing. Now, once you won the bid for the tax collection then you would kind of farm it out to the local folk to be able to actually collect the taxes. And if you were a local folk, you had a certain goal that you had to meet, and anything above that goal was considered profit. And thus, you can see how extortion and other things would happen because of that. So as the people... We're going back and forth during the workday. The tax collector would stop them, inspect what they were carrying, 
and then impose a tax upon them. Now, the tax from the Jewish perspective was inherently wrong because it was going to the Romans who were Gentiles who were pagans. So they rejected it on religious grounds. The tax collectors were often considered thieves, and because of their constant contact with Gentiles, because of their constant contact with Gentiles, they were also considered suspect, but generally unclean. So here's Matthew. Matthew is a thief, a traitor, and an unclean person. You have to get that. Now, his booth probably was on a trade route, the Via Maris, which is a major trade route near the city of Capernaum on the lake, lake shore of Galilee. Okay? So he'd have his booth set up there. And as people would come by, he would impose the tax. Now, this is speculation on my part. Can't prove this whatsoever. But I wondered, would he have taxed the fishermen? Would he have taxed Peter, James, John, Andrew? See, it's likely he would have at least seen them. He would have at least known them. So here's, that's the setup. You got the setup? Who Matthew is, the tax collector. Now, one day, Jesus and his disciples are passing by Matthew. And notice that Matthew does not reach out. He doesn't call out to Jesus at all, does he? He doesn't say anything about that. As a matter of fact, we don't even know how much contact Matthew would have had with Jesus. He probably would have known about him. Maybe he heard him preach. Maybe he didn't. That's all speculation. We don't know that. The reason I want to make sure Matthew is seen as this thief, this traitor, this unclean person is because we often want to soften Matthew up before Jesus calls him. We want to say, well, you know what? He probably knew about him. His heart was already coming to faith in Christ Jesus. But that's, we don't know that. That's speculation on our part. So Jesus comes to this traitor, this unclean person. I mean, Matthew hadn't done anything to win the Lord's favor, had he? I mean, who would you want as one of your disciples? Who would you want on your team, so to speak, right? There's, there's, uh, he certainly wasn't like the centurion, by the way. At least the centurion said, but only say the word, and my servant would be healed. I mean, at least there was that faith, right? Or Nathanael. Jesus said of Nathanael, Behold an Israelite indeed in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael seemed to be a good and upright man. Somebody you want on your team. And there was Peter, fierce in his love and loyal, right? And then there's John, the disciple of love. I mean, these are all the people you want. But Matthew, to stop and talk to him? He didn't deserve it, did he? From an out appearance, he did not deserve God's mercy. And that's the problem. You and I only want to give mercy to those who deserve it. But here's the point. We only want to give mercy to the deserving, but that's not mercy. Mercy is not getting what you deserve. Matthew deserved the punishment Jesus said, no, follow me. Let me give you an example that might help illustrate. A young mother, not a young mother, but a mother once approached Napoleon asking for a pardon for her son. The emperor replied that the man had considered, had done two offenses, and because of those two offenses, the punishment should be death. But I don't ask for justice, the mother explained. I plead for mercy, but your son does not deserve mercy, said Napoleon. Sir, the woman cried, it would not be mercy if he deserved it. And mercy is all I ask for. Well then, said the emperor, I will have mercy. And he spared her son. This is the idea of mercy. 
And to Jesus, Matthew said this, follow me. Follow me. In those words, mercy's given. Follow me. A pardon is made, not but because he deserved it, because God is gracious, he's loving, God is merciful. In our reading from Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4, it says, But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together in Christ. Now, can you imagine you're sitting there? You're despised by your countrymen? And you're given a new life, following Christ Jesus. Matthew must have been surprised and amazed. See, true mercy is the promise of life given, a new life given through love. God is merciful with you. In Christ Jesus, he has given you a new life because of his mercy. How would you react? Would you just kind of go, yeah, fine. That's nice. Good. It's another Sunday. Or would you be eternally grateful? Would you be amazed? Would it make your heart move? Would you celebrate? And that's what they did. There was a celebration of mercy. Maybe we should just have one time of worship where we just celebrate God's mercy. So Matthew's reaction was twofold. He celebrated in Luke's gospel. It says that, uh, well, for one thing, he literally gave up everything. He stood up and he walked away from everything. He forsook all for the sake of Jesus and his mercy, and then he celebrated. And in Luke's account, it was a great feast. And you know who was there at that great feast? It was not the kings. It was not the hobnobbing with great, wonderful people. It was the other tax collectors, the thieves, the robbers, the other sinners, they were the ones who were celebrating. Because you know, you know, when you are so down and you receive mercy, the only thing to do is celebrate. That you've got a new life. A new life. Matthew was probably like this. He was saying, Jesus said, follow me. Come on, come on, come on. You can't believe it. Come to this feast. I can't believe it. That's the celebration. But you know what? God's mercy is often seen not as a celebration. It's often seen as this. It is seen as a scandal. It's seen as a scandal. Verse 11, and when the Pharisees saw this, they said to the disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? The Pharisees were shocked. They wouldn't have been at the dinner. They would actually have been outside being able to look inside the house to see what was going on. And for a rabbi to go and eat with those sinners was awful. It was awful because it wasn't just preaching or teaching, but now to eat with them meant that he would not condemn them by eating with them. And this was scandalous, and they hated it. You can almost hear their voices drip with contempt. Why does your teacher, why does your teacher eat with such low life, such scum of the earth? He can't be a good teacher. And that's the nature of God's mercy. It is often scandalous to us who think we are righteous. By the way, that's why the account of Jesus with the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman, and then the Good Samaritan parable, that's why to the Jews of the day, it was an outrageous, outrageous thing. Because as bad as tax collectors were, Samaritans were worse. 
To say the word Samaritan as a Jew was to use it almost as a curse word. People would literally walk miles out of their way so they didn't go through the land of Samaria. That's how much they hated the Samaritan. So Jesus, to sit at the well with the Samaritan woman, was outrageous. And now, to make the point of God's mercy, he tells the parable of the Good Samaritan. You remember the Good Samaritan parable? So Jesus is talking to a lawyer. What are the greatest commandments? Love the Lord your God. What's the second? Love your neighbor as yourself. And the lawyer says, well, who's my neighbor? Okay, I don't know if you had that attitude. I just put it on there. (laughs) But you know, so Jesus tells the story of the Good Samaritan. Now, there's a man who's wounded. He's lying on the road. He's dying. A priest goes by and does not stop him. A Levite goes by and does not stop. But who stops? The Samaritan, the cursed one. And he not only binds his wounds and takes care of him, he brings him to an inn. Not only brings him to an inn, he pays the innkeeper. And then he says, I'm going to pass this way again. And if I owe you more, I'll pay more. And then Jesus says this. Which one of the three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? He said to him, the one who showed mercy. And Jesus said to him, you go and do likewise. Now, a lot of people want to take that parable and just make it into a matter of morality. Like, here's how I be a good neighbor. I simply help people in need. But if And and that's true, that's true. But if that's the only thing, then you miss the point. The point is mercy comes from God himself. It is God's very nature that shows mercy. And you and I are supposed to reflect God's mercy. Look, let's do this. That neighbor you hate which you're not supposed to, but the neighbor you hate, and I know there's probably some neighbor you don't like, when their car breaks down, do you stop to help them out? Should. What if they need a little bit of help with food or even rent or something like that? Would you help them out? You should. Not because it makes you a good person, but because God is merciful, and thus so are we. This is the point, and this is the scandal, and this is where we we just struggle with this idea of mercy. So here it is. Mercy is not simply a matter of human morality. Mercy comes from the very nature of God himself, and we need no look no further than the cross to see the fullness of God's mercy. We deserve God's wrath. Nobody likes to say that, but that's what scripture says. We deserve God's wrath and the fullness of God's wrath, but God spared us. But who did he not spare? He did not spare his son. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. This is the nature of God's mercy. You see, all along, God desires, God has a desire for mercy. Going on in our reading, it says, those who are well have no need of of a physician, but those who are sick, go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice, for I came not to call the righteous, but the sinners. Here, Jesus makes it plain, doesn't he? That he is coming for those who are sick and those who are dying. And we don't mean just that in physically physical sense, do we? But we mean that in a spiritual sense. Dead in our sins, dying, mortally wounded. And we cannot heal ourselves. But we often deny 
anything that is wrong with us. And we do that in so many different ways. Here. Don't worry, I'm fine, it's just a cold. Right? Men, I don't know, this could be the man's men's, no, or, or maybe the women too, right? It could be any one of us, right? Don't worry, I'm fine. I don't have to go see the do do doctor, I'll be fine. Right? And we deny our own physical illness. We also deny the illness of sin. This could be our tombstone instead. Don't worry, I'm fine. It's just a little sin. It's not just a little sin. And Jesus said, I didn't come for those who are in good health. I came for those who are sick, who are dying and dying in their sin. And he comes to each one of us just like he came to Matthew. And he says, follow me. Follow me. And I will give you mercy. I will give you restoration. I will give you a new life where you didn't have one before. He says, follow me. And then he says this too. He says, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. Here, Jesus is referring to a quote from Isaiah chapter 6, verse 6. And by the way, Hosea, if you take a look at Hosea, you see Israel's unfaithfulness, uh, unfaithful priests, princesses, adultery, drunkenness, idolatry, stumbling. I mean, it's, it's a mess. Israel is a mess. And they have fallen mightily and are condemned because of their sin. But against this backdrop of Israel's sin, Hosea, Hosea reminds Israel of the Lord's loving faithfulness. And he calls them from unfaithfulness to a new life. The Lord does not desire Israel's destruction. He desires her to live. The Lord does not desire your destruction. He desires you to live. It's as if he's, God is saying something like this. Listen and to, to, to the nation of Israel and Hosea. Listen, all of those sacrifices you're making, you don't understand that the sacrifices are to remind you to make sure you know of my great mercy. You don't understand about the sacrifices, but now you're making them empty and meaningless. I desire, I delight in your steadfast love of the keeping of the covenant. I, I delight in mercy. You see this word mercy, it's a short little word, but when you take a look at it in both the Greek and Hebrew, it's actually a very complex word. Mercy can mean steadfast love, kindness, loving kindness, goodness, grace, compassion. And brothers and sisters, this is the promise we have in Christ Jesus of God's mercy made full and complete in him. You know John 3.16, right? Can you fill in the blank on your sermon notes? I'll read it. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. The promise of mercy is for whoever believes in him. Richard Baxter, a prominent English Puritan from the 1600s wrote this, I thank God for that word whosoever. If God had said there was mercy for Richard Baxter, I am so vile a sinner that I would have thought he meant some other Richard Baxter. But when he says Who, whosoever, I know that includes me, the worst of all Richard Baxters. <sighs> whoever, whoever faith in Christ receiving the mercy of God and the mercy of God, and the love of God, and the graciousness of God 
go hand in hand, and you cannot separate one from the other. Mercy. Where is mercy most found for us Christians? It is not in our lives, it is in the cross of Christ. Jesus crucified for us so that we may have new life. Two questions for you this morning. Are you amazed and grateful at God's mercy through the cross of Christ? Are you amazed or is it just an intellectual thing? How will you live in light of God's mercy through the cross of Christ? Let us pray. Merciful, gracious, loving God, we thank you that you have poured on us your mercy through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Oh, let us fill our hearts with your mercy knowing that through Jesus and him alone, we are saved, we have life. And we simply give you thanks and praise this morning. Amen. We hope that you've been blessed by this message. If you have any questions or you would like to grow deeper in your faith, please visit our website at joyccc.com. Again, that's joyccc.com. God's peace and joy in Christ Jesus be with you.